Dear esteemed guests, faculty, honorable delegates, and board members, welcome to the 14th annual Georgetown Qatar Model United Nations Conference. My name is Mudassar Raza Shakir, and I am the Deputy Secretary General of this conference. Now, I'm sure you're all excited to be here, so I'll save you the torture of you know, me talking about my own experience in the MUN platform, right? But what I will do is ask you to take a moment to thank our board and staff members who have been working tirelessly to make this MUN happen. I realize that as delegates, we don't see all the work that goes into planning a conference like this. It, but believe me, it's truly exhausting. However, seeing all of you here, I realize the fruits of our labor have paid off. Now, every day in the news, we hear stories of communities prosecuted simply for existing. Hence, the GMAN team thought the best way to learn and tackle about this issue is by setting the theme of this year's conference as diversity and integration in a world of conflict. To facilitate the discussion, we have chosen topics and committees such as the Rohingya crisis in the Security Council and the persecution of Muslim minorities around the globe in the Human Rights Council. Each and every one of our topics and committees were carefully selected to ensure everyone here engages in a discussion and brings it to the eyes of the world. But our Secretary General will talk more about this year's theme. Now, finally, I would just like to say, delegates, we have four days of debate and learning ahead of us. I encourage everyone here to learn and take a stand for what is right, both within and when you leave the conference. For ultimately, it is you who will go out into the world and make a difference. Thank you. It is my distinct pleasure to introduce the next speaker, Dr. Ahmed Dalal, who is the Dean of Georgetown University in Qatar. Dr. Dalal earned his PhD from Columbia University in Islamic Studies and his Bachelor's of Engineering in Mechanical Engineering from the American University of Beirut. Dr. Dalal has written and lectured widely on a variety of topics, including the Islamic disciplines of learning in medieval and early modern Islamic societies, the development of traditional and exact Islamic sciences, Islamic medieval thought, the early modern evolution of Islamic revivalism and intellectual movements, Islamic law, and the causes and consequences of the September 11, 2001 attacks. Please join me in welcoming to the stage Dean Dalal. Your Excellency, Mr. Hassan Zawadi, honored advisors and students from around the world. On behalf of the faculty, staff, and students of Georgetown University in Qatar, welcome. In our 14 years of organizing the Georgetown Model UN, we have been honored by the passion, energy, and commitment of students like you from all over the world. Each year, student delegates from across Qatar and all over the world come to Doha to take part in the roles of diplomacy that keep our world turning. European, North American, South American, Middle Eastern, North African, African and Asian countries have been variously represented, with these students all converging on Doha to debate issues from, from ongoing current events. If we reflect for a moment on what has changed in the 14 years we've hosted this Model UN, imagine that the first students who came here are now about 30 years old. And when they came, some may have been lucky enough to bring the fresh to the market first ever iPhone. Even I have an iPhone now. <laughs> now the world economy is predicted to undergo that, what, what they are calling the fourth industrial revolution. This era is characterized by the fusion of technologies that blur the lines between the physical, digital, and biological spheres. Those of you in attendance last year will recall that the digi digital revolution was something that was touched on in last year's Model UN. With this revolution comes ecological constraints, a multipolar international order, and rising inequality that is being called 
Globalization 4.0. For this session, you will be discussing the real substance of Globalization 4.0, how to negotiate diversity and integration with conflicting and sometimes violent interests. As much as the world is changing, what has not changed is that you are participants in a great and noble cause to build a better world. You come to Georgetown, Qatar at a special time for us because we are joining the School of Foreign Service in Washington, D.C. in celebrating the foundation of School of Foreign Service 100 years ago. What you are training for here today is to address some of the needs and problems identified by Edmund Walsh in 1919 when, in the aftermath of World War I, one, nations were recognizing their dependence on other nations. Walsh, who founded the School of Foreign Service, and the world recognized the need for competent professionals who are able to forge peaceful re relations with the world by speaking other languages, understanding history, and mastering the finer principles of law, political science, and commerce. In this spirit, Edmund Walsh founded the School of Foreign Service, and it is in this spirit that students continue to gather here every year to practice skills and prepare themselves for their own future in a globalized world. It took a lot of hard work to come to the table today, and this is a microcosm of, the, of what the United Nations delegates do when they show up to their councils. Like you, they come with various levels of background knowledge, varied amounts of sleep, time spent on research, and with a kaleidoscope of different cultural upbringings, perspectives, biases, and agendas. We hope that during your time here, you learn not just about the process of global decision making, but also about negotiating from both a position of weakness and a position of strength, ultimately learning where compromise can lead to shared gains. We hope that during your time here, you evolve and learn the ins and outs of diplomacy, pick up some new persuasion techniques, and perhaps, most importantly, discover the power of simply listening. In many ways, we represent, you represent the youth of the world, leading by example with your will and aptitude to weigh in on some of today's most pressing issues. So I encourage you to look around you and think, how can I take this wealth of resources and opportunity and use it to help others? What can I learn today that can help change the world of, for, for, for the good? For Georgetown Model UN, you are the change we wish to see in the world. Before I end, please join me in thanking the Model UN board for organizing this wonderful event. Samira, Fiza, Modassar, Catherine, Mariam, and Khansa. and their support staff here at GUQ. Thank you for participating in our Model UN, and I hope you have a wonderful experience. I now turn the podium back over to this year's capable MUN board members who will proceed with the program, starting with the reading of this year's participating schools, followed by the UN Honor Pledge. This year's UN Secretary General, Samir al Hajj Abed, will then give her student address and introduce tonight's keynote speaker. His Excellency, Mr. Hassan Dhuwadi. I was tempted to introduce him myself, but I wasn't allowed. <laughs> uh, the Secretary General of the Supreme Committee for Delivery and Legacy, whom you all know led uh, Qatar to a great victory just a couple of weeks ago, and we are honored to have you tonight with us. We will end the ceremonial recognition of the committee chairs before sitting down to dinner. So here is our Model UN Chief of Communications, Maryam al Harthi, for the reading of this year's participating schools. Hello, my name is Maryam al Harthi. We will now recognize the school participating in the 14th annual Georgetown MUN Conference. When your school's name is called, we ask that you stand up and remain standing. Kindly hold all your applause until this, all the schools have been called. Qatar. ACS International School, Doha. 
please hold your applause. Jazeera Academy, Al Maha Academy for Boys, Al Maha Academy for Girls, Al Minar International School, Al Bayan School for Girls, American Academy School, Amna Bint Wahab Secondary School for Girls, Arwa Bint Abdul Wahab Secondary School, Aspire Academy, Blyeth Academy, Bright Future International School, Cambridge International School, Doha Academy School, English Modern School Al Khor, Global Academy International, Voltaire, Michael E. DeBakey High School for Health Professions, Middle East International School, Newton International Academy, Newton International School, Nur al Khalij International School Doha, Philippines International School, Rabah al Adawiya Secondary School. SEK Qatar, Stafford Sri Lankan School, the American School of Doha, the Cambridge School, the International School of Shwefat, the Lebanese School of Qatar, the Next Generation, Bosnia and Herzegovina, the first Bosniak High School, Cameroon, Inko Benanjo International School, Ethiopia, International Community School Addis Ababa, the Greek Community School of Addis Ababa, Ghana, SOS Herman Menier International College, Indonesia, Global Jaya School, Morocco, American School of Marrakesh, Al Iraqi School, Nepal, Olenez School, Nigeria, American Inter International School of Abuja, Pakistan, Lahore Grammar School, OPF Senior Girls, South Africa, African Leadership Academy, Turkey, FMV Ozel Ayazaga Ishik and Fen Lissi, FMF Erinkoy Ishik High School, Sizen School. Ladies and gentlemen, the participant of the 2019 Model United Nations uh, Conference. Now it is my pleasure to welcome to the stage a member of Georgetown's class of 2019 and this year's MUN Secretary General, Samira Alahaj Abid. Honorable guests and delegates, it's an honor to be serving as your Secretary General for this year's annual Georgetown MUN conference. This will actually be my last MUN as I'm expected to graduate in May, hoping my senioritis doesn't get the best of me. Growing up, my parents always told me to pursue what I love, what I feel passionate about, and that's why I ended up at Georgetown. I know I'm standing in front of you right now giving this speech in complete confidence, but trust me, it took me four years of self-discovery to be able to stand on my feet in front of a crowd this big. I know you're all here because you love debating. You love the power and space MUN has given you to express your opinions. So I encourage each of you to take it upon you to actively participate in this year's conference. I ask you to make it your mission as students to grow. You're all here today discussing blood boiling topics, topics that our current leaders and politicians don't seem to have answers for. Don't let that hold you back. Though, oh sorry, <laughs> don't let that hold you back though. You are our future, and these are the days that you'll reminisce about the most, so make the best out of it. This year's conference theme is diversity and integration in a world of conflict. Our amazing board members and I didn't take very long to come up with this focus. You see, the theme was a reflection of the events that sparked debates across the global political platform. The board members were keen on presenting a multidimensional theme, one that highlights the existing contradictions in the world we live in. As global citizens, we should take the responsibility to understand that the world's beauty significantly lies within its diversity. The integration of global citizens into each other's communities not only makes our worldly experience more memorable and intellectual. Unfortunately, the circumstances that have led to the lead for integration also have led to great conflict and losses. In this year's conference, we attempt to cover a variety of topics from different parts of the world. A reflection of our, this, of our theme this year would be our chosen committees. The Human Rights Council will be discussing disability rights. UNESCO will be examining the politicization of holy sites. SPECPOL will be delving into civilians in unrecognized territories. And all that and many more topics that reflect upon the diversity and integration that has been caused in our world due to conflict. 
Finally, finally, we'd like to introduce a committee that was inspired by the hashtag MeToo movement, the Commission on the Status of Women. You see, both the topics and committees we chose really do interlink between conflict, whether physical, social, or emotional, and the diversity that exists in our world. For the next few days, and even after you return home, the board and I strongly encourage you to break out of your comfort zone and voice your opinion. Uh, at the end of the day, the future of our world lies within your minds. I hope you all have a memorable conference. And now, ladies and gentlemen, it is my distinct honor to introduce to you the keynote speaker of this year's Georgetown MUN 2019 conference. His Excellency Hassan al-Dawadi is the Secretary General of the Supreme Committee for Delivery and Legacy, the organization responsible for com coordinating amongst public and private entities to ensure the infrastructure and development projects are delivered in readiness for the 2022 FIFA World Cup. Prior to his appointment in March 2011 as Secretary General, he was Chief Executive Officer in Qatar's 2022 BID Committee, in which he worked closely with BID Chairman His Excellency Sheikh Mohammed bin Hamad Al Thani promoting Qatar's ultimately successful attempt to bring the FIFA World Cup to the Middle East for the first time. In addition, in addition, he also serves as the chairman of the 2022 FIFA World Cup LLC, the joint venture between FIFA and the Supreme Committee responsible for organizing and staging the event. In 2013, he was appointed to FIFA, FIFA's World Cup organizing committee as special advisor. A lawyer by profession, al Wadi previously served as general counsel for Qatar Investment Authority and Qatar Holding. He maintains a role at QIA as legal advisor to the CEO. al Wadi holds board positions at Qatar Hospitality, Qatar Chamber for Commerce and Industry, Qatar International Islamic Bank, and Shareb Properties. He is a joint advisory board member at Northwestern University, Qatar, and an advisory council member at Hamad bin Khalifa University, College of Humanities and Social Sciences, and Qatar University College of Businesses and Economics. al Wadi is a graduate in law from the University of Sheffield and speaks four languages. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming His Excellency Hassan al Wadi to the stage. Good evening, everybody, uh, and welcome to Doha for those of you who are visiting. Now, first, I'd like to extend my sincerest appreciations to the Dean, Dr. Ahmed Dalal, for providing me this opportunity and this honor, and of course, the Security Council. Thank you all for having me here. Uh, the initiatives at Georgetown, Qatar, that, uh, that they undertake over here has continuously enriched the level of political, economic, social, and cultural debate and discussion. Now, this conference is part of the tapestry, and I'm very proud that it is being hosted here, and it's hosting such an impressive gathering of the diplomats of tomorrow. And as I was saying earlier when I came in, you guys do intimidate me, so take it easy on me. Ladies and gentlemen, now, as students of international relations and the bodies that hold our fragile geopolitical world together, you all understand that the, tecto the tectonic plates underpinning the multilateral global order that the United Nations system preserves and depends upon are shuddering, as Chancellor Merkel alluded to at the Munich Security Conference. Proponents of multilateralism, multiculturalism, and a global system where the international community works together through diplomatic means to prevent and solve conflicts, faces challenges of a new inward-facing nationalism that aggressively rejects the international order. Globalization's lean towards deepened inclusion and respect for diversity is under question from those who perceive themselves as losing out as the world becomes smaller. Now, technology and communication has brought the world closer together, and at no stage in mankind's history, have humans from different cultures, faiths, religions, and political backgrounds had better access to a vast array of theories and opinions. And yet, in spite of this closeness and interconnectivity, this enhanced access to information, we are, as societies, drifting apart. Instead of opening our minds and entering into considered debates and discussions, people are not easily able to access opinions and beliefs that suit their own. They're able to create their own echo chambers that supports and provides continuous validation of their own belief systems at the exclusion of others. Now, the global infrastructure that has held our world together is under threat. And if we look at the international order from a macro level, our world has never been more prosperous. Multicultural metropolises are at the center of our global economy. We are more interconnected than ever, however, the fissures and cracks of that infrastructure are being exploited by actors seizing upon the opportunity of those who fear the unknown. And in this environment, 
It is absolutely vital that we take advantage of platforms that celebrates our common humanity, that breaks down barriers that are increasingly wedged between us as citizens of the world. We need to treasure multilateral platforms. We need to work together as nations and people to enhance and improve them. For while bodies such as the United Nations are highly imperfect, they are nevertheless more vital than ever. And we need to delve deeper. We need to delve as global citizens deeper to arrest the populist shift. We need to stop it. We must think differently. We must think disruptively. We must maximize every possible platform with potential to unite and to bring humanity closer together. Sports, and in particular football, is just one of those platforms. It touches the human spirit regardless of location, regardless of beliefs, culture, or politics. And at its best, at both elite and more importantly, at the grassroots level, it teaches honesty, it teaches integrity, humility, professionalism, teamwork, sportsmanship, and respect of your opponent. Now, it is unfortunate that sports is too often the subject of initiatives that while they may be well-meaning, often amount to little more than tokenism. The international community of leaders and thinkers often place sports in a box. It is CSR, it is healthy living. The extraordinary developmental and unifying potential that sports has is too often ignored or sidelined. Now its power is truly transformative. And this power is brought to life very clearly through the World Cup. The British sociologist and author of The Ball is Round, David Goldblatt, describes the magnitude of the event profoundly. If there is a global culture and global humanity, then the World Cup, more than any other phenomenon, is where those tales are told. And we are fortunate then that the game that we have chosen as our collective avatar should be so inventive a storyteller that a single game of football, the World Cup final, can, for 90 minutes, bind so many strands of this turbulent planet together. And that is exactly why we bid to host the World Cup in Qatar. We wanted to tap into that spirit that Goldblatt so eloquently describes. A spirit that brings together 3.4 billion worldwide viewers, and for the first time in history, with the Middle East as its backdrop. Not a backdrop of conflict and war, but as the host of an event that truly unites every strand of humanity like no other. What vehicle, other than sports and events such as the World Cup, could have the power to break down such divisions, even if some may dismiss these seminal moments as transient? We just need to look back at the World Cup in Russia. The new cycle in political developments may well have influenced global views of the host country prior to the event. But what other, what other event would bring thousands of Swedes and Koreans together in Nizhny Novgorod? What other event would inspire thousands of Tunisians and English to converge together in Volgograd? And what other event would introduce the locals of Saransk to thousands of Colombians and Japanese? Now I firmly believe, and I've experienced it myself, these visitors and their Russian hosts in various cities nurtured special bonds and established memories that will last a lifetime. Stereotypes on these days were shattered. Friendships were born. And all through the common language of football. South Africa's World Cup in 2010. A celebration of a country's arduous journey from the apartheid era to the rainbow nation and the international stage. And it was also a celebration of the African continent, as we saw in evidence by the overwhelming local support for the Ghanaian team that reached the quarterfinals. I'm glad that some people experienced that. I was about to say you might be too young to have experienced it, but thank you for that support. <laughs> the international community and the visitors to the finals witnessed a proud, multicultural nation demonstrating to the world its ability to host an incredible major event. Now, were these moments seminal? Were they transient for Russia and South Africa? Were the opportunities fully exploited to last a lifetime? These questions are open to debate. But for one nation, its modern history can be told through the World Cup. In 1954 was the first time that West Germany lifted the World Cup trophy. This came nine years after the conclusion of a war that tore Europe and the world apart. 
the West German national team shocked the world by triumphing over the, over the famous Hungarian team, the mighty Magyars. A West Germany that was mired in self-doubt and economic turmoil, living through a complicated relationship with nationalism, was suddenly in one moment free to celebrate. Now, according to Der Spiegel's edition, printed the day after the final, winning the World Cup was the founding cultural moment of the Federal Republic. Now, if we shift forward 52 years later, the World Cup in Germany in 2006 is considered one of the most memorable sporting events of contemporary history. 16 years post-reunification, the German nation invited the world to experience an economic powerhouse, a truly vibrant multicultural society, and stereotypes previously propagated about Germany were dismantled. Now, I've spoken to many German friends who've told me that a new national identity was cemented through hosting the World Cup in 2006. And on the day after the final, the Times of London ran the headline, never mind the finals, true winners are Germany. This is an English newspaper praising a German achievement. Talk about miracles happening. <laughs> Germany 2006's motto was a time to make friends. And it played out this way. Effective, efficient, process-oriented Germany was now all of a sudden fun-loving, modern, creative, and within two years, was considered the most admired country brand in the world. Now we, in Qatar, are working to create our own seminal moment in history, not just for Qatar, but for the region, through the 2022 FIFA World Cup. In 2022, we expect about 1.3 to 1.6 million visitors to Qatar. Now for many of those, this will be the first time that they set foot in the Middle East. To the billions, who will tune in around the world and the million plus fans that will touch down on our shores in 2022, we want to showcase our country and the region in the most positive manner possible. We want to showcase our renowned hospitality and culture above all. We want to showcase our humanity. We want visitors from all over the world to understand that people in our region are multidimensional just like them. They're passionate just like them, fun loving, and more importantly that we all love football just like them. We want people to delve beyond the stereotypes and the myths that are perpetrated to divide the East and the West. And we want to form lasting relationships on a person-to-person -person level. We want to take this precious opportunity to respect, to accept, and to celebrate our differences. And this is the true legacy of sporting mega events and the 2022 World Cup in Qatar. It will harness the spirit, and it will serve as a rallying point in the history of our region, as it has for other countries and regions in the past. Now, we are working very hard to utilize the World Cup as a catalyst to accelerate the, prog the progress that we are committed to as a nation. We've made significant strides in addressing issues relating to workers' welfare, for example. We have improved standards through a serious commitment to reform and an understanding that transparent international cooperation is in our best interests. We also have recognized the bleak situation outlined by the United Nations Development Programs Report in 2016 on the Arab youth. The report called on Arab nations to urgently prioritize adopting policies that ensure well-being, self-determination, and good citizenship of our young population. Now, the key to development and stability in our region is in enabling youth, yourselves, to shape your own future. A platform with such incredible power must be harnessed and must be re responsibly utilized to improve lives and create a better future for a region of the world that is in desperate need for sparks of optimism. From our side, we've established the Center of Excellence, the Jasur Institute, in collaboration with Georgetown Qatar and other partners, and it provides academic and professional skills that young professionals need to gain access to the regional sporting and hospitality industry that we are hopeful that the World Cup will inspire. <clears throat> and recognition of the talent that exists across the MENA region. We've also launched an initiative called Challenge 22 that calls upon young entrepreneurs to create innovative concepts and inventions that could be used at the World Cup. We provide financial and technical assistance to the best ideas and businesses and provide them with the ultimate plat platform for marketing their product to the world in 2022. Now our region has talent. We want to provide them with a chance to take their ideas born within the region onto the global stage. And we are taking action. We are using the World Cup. We are using its power, not only to build our own nation, 
but to sow the seeds of that better future and create the environment that the young people of our region need to sense those sparks of optimism. Now, ultimately, I personally believe that the most profound legacy of all after the Middle East's first World Cup will be the breaking down of stereotypes and people coming together. It is our responsibility, all of us, to ensure that we take advantage of these platforms to celebrate humanity, that bind us together and to break down the barriers that are increasingly wedged between us. It is incumbent upon us to ensure that these sparks of light touch upon the people of this planet in the most meaningful way possible. And what better platform exists than the one that touches 3.4 billion people simultaneously? Now, the former German chancellor and mayor of Berlin, Willy Brandt, famously said, walls in people's heads are sometimes more durable than walls made of concrete blocks. Sports breaks down those walls. The universal language of football manifested at the World Cup tears down those walls. And for a month, the majority of the planet unites together in celebration of our humanity and our diversity. This is the legacy that the international community must recognize and must elevate. To remind them that in spite of the talk of clashes of civilizations and divisions, in 2022, the World Cup will and must bring people from every corner of the world together in Qatar. Americans will chat with Iranians about football. Japanese will be partying with Brazilians. Peruvians will be dancing with Nigerians. And more half of the planet will be watching. And perhaps, through football in the World Cup, we will be inspired to remember the words of John F. Kennedy, and that in spite of our differences in language, skin, color, or religion, our most basic link is that we all, we all inhabit this planet. We all breathe the same air, and we all cherish our children's future. We are all mortal. Now the answers to the variety of crises, sorry, just very quickly I'll finish. <laughs> I'm close to the end, don't worry. <laughs> now, the answers, answers to the variety of the crises that the international community face will be found in many different forms. And I'm not here to argue that sports alone is an all-encompassing vehicle for world peace. But what I'm conveying to you is that it has too much potential to serve as a mere sideshow. So when all of you sit down, debate, work with your partners during your sessions to find solutions to the global issues under discussion, I urge all of you to recognize sports power and to integrate it into your thinking. Thank you and good evening. Now you can clap. Thank you so much, Your Excellency. Hello, my name is Catherine Danilowitz, and I would now like to ask all committee chairs to stand up upon hearing their name. Security Council, Chair Hansa Maria. Co-Chair. Co-Chair Aisha Iqbal. Rapporteur, please hold your applause till the end. <laughs> Rapporteur, Iman Ismail. Human Rights Council, Chair, Maria Malharthi. Co-Chair, Menahil Nadim. Nadim, Rapporteur, Normain Sisson. Sp Special Political and Decolonization Committee, Chair, Zubas Shakir. Co-Chair, Zoya Faruqi. Rapporteur, Abdullah Al-Malki. Disarmament and International Security Committee, Chair Mohammed Abahuash, Co Chair Kushbu Shah, Rapporteur Shema Benkermi, The Committee on the Status of Women, Chair Sara El Amin, Co Chair Bothena Althani, Rapporteur Camilla Idris, Crisis Committee, Chair Sarah Abdelgani, Co Chair Taha Kalim. Bukhari, Bukhari. <laughs> uh, United Nations Development Program, Chair Talal Abdul Nasir, Co Chair Lulua Al Saig, Rapporteur Ayman Khan, the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization, Chair Malak Elma, <laughs> Co Chair Nadine El Dehabi, Rapporteur Maryam Hassan, the Arab League, Chair Salma Hassan, Co-Chair Lean Al-Rabat. I would also like to invite um, Dean Dalal and His Excellency Mr. al Thawadi back to the stage.
Thank you. Um, delegates, please remain seated after the closing gavel. You will be escorted to your committee room by a staff member. I now invite Hansa Maria to bring the gavel to order. With the power invested in me by the student board, I, it is my pleasure to declare the Georgetown Model United Nations 2019 conference officially open. <laughs> Delegates, Delegates, please take your seats. <laughs> 